Canadian. I see Tara Biller. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute both of you. And welcome everyone. It's Monday, right? Monday, April 13th. My name is Andrea. I'm with PMD Alliance. So glad that you guys are taking some time out of your day to join us for this online chat. I had a sneak peek at some of the slides and I think it's just universal content that whether it's whether you have Parkinson's or don't, whether it's COVID or not, this is just some some great content um, that uh, that our guest speaker has put together. So, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our movement neuro uh, movement disorder neurologist, hostess with the mostest, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Subramanian. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks again for hosting, you guys. Good to see everyone's uh, faces and. Uh, virtual support group land. So um, Tara and I got to catch up yesterday. We've never formally met and um, she came highly recommended by um, Jory Fleischer, who was a speaker a few weeks ago. The two of them are, I think, quite close and have become close friends and almost like family. Um, I understand her other otherwise name is Auntie um, and some of the <laughs> members of the Fleischer household. Um, and uh, as you know, Jory and I have been very passionate about trying to help people in this uh, time of um, social distancing and trying to keep people socially connected. And um, Tara used to work with Jory out in New York um, and then ended up moving out to uh, Seattle um, where she works with the Swedish and she's a nurse practitioner in a group of um, uh, I think four or five doctors uh, focusing largely on Parkinson's disease, which has been her passion. Uh, she also has a really interesting background in public health that she taught me about yesterday. And um, this is almost a second career in many regards um, as a nurse practitioner. And so I think we'll have an interesting discussion. She has some slides to share with us first, and, um, and then we'll get into some of the other kind of hats that she wears. Uh, she's really been very interested in education as a focus in her um, uh, championing for uh, Parkinson's patients and has uh, been passionate about trying to figure out ways to help educate patients and, and other providers um, in this space. And so I look forward to hearing from her. Um, she, she put together um, some slides that we'll go through and then we'll take some questions at the end and she and I will maybe chat a little bit about all these different things that she brings to our discussion um, in, in the middle. So um, take it away, Tara. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian, and thank you to Andrea and uh, Amy and um, everyone at the, uh, at the PMD Alliance. And I wanted to also uh, take a moment and say that it is April, which is World Parkinson's Month, and that Saturday was uh, World Parkinson's Day, which kind of blew my mind that we're already <laughs> this far into April, um, but it really, uh, I'm really pleased to be here with you all uh, and to virtually meet you all because um, I haven't, I don't think I've met any of you before. Um, and if you haven't worked with a nurse practitioner, I'm happy to answer any of your questions if you have any of those um, about what it means to, to work with a nurse practitioner and movement disorders. But um, I'll go ahead and, and get started just to, to get through some of these slides that I think you'll have um, no problem understanding because there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of communal feelings about um, uncertainty right now. So, and I'm going to um, not show my face so that you can focus today on, um, uh, on the actual slides. Um, okay. So, how do we tolerate uncertainty, right? How do we accept the biggest unknowns? Uncertainty can affect our physical and mental well-beings and it can affect everyone, our patients, clinicians, caregivers, and yes, even government officials. And in the wake of so many unknowns, uncertainty breeds fear. Um, and so I hope today we can kind of think about the fact that it's not only normal, but we've already been doing it. Reality is and always has been uncertain. Um, and 
you already have the tools to accept the unknown. You've conquered 100% of your days in this lifetime already. And you've never known what was going to happen. And when thoughts wander and the fear of uncertainty, that thing that we can't control, it breeds more anxiety. When we remain present in the moment and accept what we can control one day, or even if it's just one hour or 10 minutes at a time, our thoughts remain present and we can become more in control of our body and mind. So the goal is how can we translate this complete unknown, this uncertainty into something that we can control into something that can actually be positive, both for ourselves and our, our friends and family and our communities. So I found this and I felt it to be really helpful. Saying this out loud can actually be um, something that's really effective and we'll talk more about affirmations a little bit later. So I'm gonna actually read this to you. I can't control when or if something bad happens. It's out of my hands and no amount of worrying will prevent it. So that is the coronavirus, right? We do not have control over this pandemic. But I do control how I respond to the world around me and how I take care of myself. So that means social distancing, washing your hands, making sure that the loved ones around you are doing the same and that they're taken care of. If you know that your neighbors might need help, that you're able to be uh, t looking after them. Um, so, so kind of differentiating between what you can and what you can't control. Okay. And then this one here, don't fuel, don't fuel the fire. Um, anxiety can become really exacerbated by the sensationalism, right? In the news and on social media. I know you guys have heard this before, so I won't uh, go too far into this, but I will say, please, please limit your social media. Um, that can be a, a big trigger for a lot of people. And the same thing with news. We do have to get our information and, um, you know, everybody gets their news from different sources. And uh, if you can limit it to, I believe the World Health Organization recommends um, 30, no more than 30 minutes. Um, uh, but if you can limit it to reading, that's even better than watching the news. And that's because pictures and video can sometimes cause um, a reactivity um, that, that you don't necessarily need, right? The sensationalism can be exacerbated by media and, and it's not gonna do you any good. So stick with the facts, right? We've all watched the news. It's not to say that we should never, but limiting it can be really helpful. And this is something, I know Andrea mentioned um, that this topic kind of goes beyond COVID and it really does. I have patients all the time that, um, that with anxiety, and hey, it's not just patients. Everybody has anxiety. And something that a lot of uh, people struggle with is um, anxiety that sometimes happens at bedtime, right? We, we have trouble going to sleep because of anxiety built up over the day. And people sometimes like to watch uh, the news at night. I strongly recommend trying to avoid this if possible. Um, and I recommend to patients that if you're watching news at night, stop. And if you have to, I patients tell me, well, you know, my wife and I have watched TV every night for the past 40 years. That's not going to change. Switch it to Seinfeld. I mean, try, try something different. Try something lighter. Um, it can be a, a lot easier to, to, um, to fall asleep when you don't have these images running through your head. Some of the sensationalism that comes with these, um, the video and the graphic images that media is, is asked to put out there. Um, and then the last part, comparing yourself with others. Sometimes this is a, a, a difficult thing to do when we're, when we're talking about um, uh, not only how, how we're stressed with, with the current situation, but also feelings of, of guilt that might come. So um, perhaps you're feeling like there's a lot of um, you know, there, there's new anxiety that you're feeling overwhelmed with, or perhaps it's that you're feeling guilty that you're used to be the one who takes care of people. And now you're feeling guilty that now you're the one who's feeling really stressed. And that's a new, a new thing that I think a lot of people are experiencing where, wow, I'm used to being the one who's taking care of people. And now what am I supposed to do? That guilt is common. And I think we need to really replace that with some self-care measures to say, 
it is okay. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to feel like you're frustrated right now because we're, this is a really new thing. Nobody's gone through this before. You're allowed to, to take on a new role and feel like you need support. Um, and so I think giving ourselves a little grace, a little, um, a little break is especially uh, important right now. Okay, so this is a, um, a, a way to interrupt negative thinking. It's an acronym. Uh, the first part of it is STOP. And uh, that means to interrupt the, whatever you're doing, interrupting the cycle to stop your negative thinking. Um, stopping whatever you're doing, whether it be if you're reading something and it's making you feel anxious or watching something on TV, stopping whatever you're doing and observing your body. What are you physically feeling? Sometimes we know that physically, uh, when we're anxious, our breathing and heart rates can increase. We can, we can become short of breath. It can, you know, anxiety can affect our GI tracts. It's really important that we recognize it's okay to have this anxiety, but then to reel it in um, with some of these techniques. So we want to stop and feel this feeling, recognize how we're feeling physically. And then the third part, label it, saying, I don't know, or this is unhelpful. And it's okay to have that label. And interestingly, I was reading that when you give a, when you give a label to something, actually acknowledging that you're not sure what it is or this is not helpful to me, um, your amygdala in your brain actually becomes less active and certain parts of your prefrontal cortex that are, um, that are involved in regulating uh, emotion and helpful um, decision-making can become more active. So that's an interesting, interesting thing that I read. Um, and so we want to remind ourselves it's okay to feel this way. The final part is shifting. We want to shift to take breaths. Um, breathing is a, I know breath work is something you guys have talked about in the past, but uh, I can't stress that enough. And affirmations is something we'll talk about in a minute, but shifting the focus. Even some, sometimes just looking in a different direction, uh, taking your attention off of what is bothering you in that, in that particular moment can be really helpful. Now this slide actually gives me a little anxiety, so <laughs> I apologize if it feels that way, but I wanted to show it because it, um, there's, there's something really cool about uh, the, what it can do for you. So this battery, I, I usually use a, a coffee mug, maybe that's because I'm in Seattle, uh, hailing from New York, but uh, when, when I draw a coffee cup for, for people and I say every night, if you, if you color in how you're feeling, so um, you can see at the bottom, it says, I'm empty. Uh, and if you're feeling empty, you'll draw in that bottom part or the bottom part of your coffee cup or the bottom part of your battery and say, I'm really feeling empty. So you, you pinpoint what's draining you and you, you try to create a boundary and then think about what is one thing you can do to fill you up the next day. So every night or the same time every day, draw your coffee cup or draw your battery. And then something that you can reflect on after a week um, or two weeks and kind of see what did I do that day and how did I feel? You can do this anytime. You can do this during, during this time of, of uncertainty. You can do this after starting a new medication um, to see you know, how you're feeling. It, it can be really helpful be, when you're having some ups and downs and not knowing how you're feeling. Sometimes we're not sure one day is good and one day is not so good, but it's good to triage how we're feeling because then we can sort of say, well, what did we do to make that suffering less? What, and, and in the midst of all of this uncertainty, it can be really difficult to say, wait a second, what did I do in that moment that made me feel better? Or did I do something that didn't help? So if we're able to, to kind of visualize it, I think for some people that can be really helpful. Um, maybe not make a slide this busy, but a coffee cup or a, a, a coloring in general can be really helpful. We'll talk about some other ways to, um, to execute self-care exercises, including coloring in a little bit. Uh, so here are some of the affirmations. Things that you can say to yourself when you're anxious. So when you're, when you're feeling like your mind is going a little wild, Remember that your body and your mind are on the same team. This feeling will pass. This is only temporary. 
I've felt this before and I've gotten through it. Those are important things that you can remind yourself when you're going through uh, any feelings of uncertainty. Uh, and it's a good thing to kind of circle back to that first, that first uh, sort of sentiment that I was uh, referencing, which is that you've gotten through every day of your life up until today. You have figured it out. So this too shall pass. All right. And the final, the final one is, I'm going to be okay. And saying these things out loud can really give the word some meaning. So I encourage people to do this in front of the mirror. It might sound a little cheesy, but honestly, it makes a big difference to hear it out loud. And the long game. So nobody knows exactly how this goes. Not any president, no, nor TV broadcaster, nor any statistician can actually know how this is going to work. And I think there's a little bit of a... Uh, communal peace to know that, that we're in this together. Um, but historically, this is not the first crisis that has hit our public health system. It's not the first crisis to hit our economy. While we don't know how this is gonna end or when exactly this is gonna end, we do know that this will end. So we just have to play the long game. And it's important to keep moving. Avoiding a daily routine is just going to make things harder. So I love the idea of breaking it down into smaller increments. Uh, 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes of your day to do something. If you can't do something for 20 minutes, tell yourself, I'm just going to do it for 10 minutes at a time. Uh, when you can't do it for 10 minutes at a time, that's fine. Five minutes. And if you can't do something for five minutes, do it for a minute at a time. And nobody is going to get mad at you for that. Forgive yourself. That's the third point and when I can't stress to my patients, my friends, and my colleagues enough. Nobody is faulting you and uh, you should forgive yourself constantly. This is not a productivity contest and that's a really important point that I feel like we should make right now. Um, I think people often feel like during this uh, time when a lot of us are working remotely or trying to restructure our lives that we should be doing all these things and, and checking off all these boxes, but there is no right way to be living your life right now. So we need to be forgiving ourselves regularly if we start to feel, feel uh, badly or start to feel like, oh, we're not doing what we said we were gonna do on our list today. So that's really important. Giving ourselves a lot of compassion. Okay. Um, Here's some examples of that five, breaking down that routine, right? So if you need to write it down, that can sometimes be helpful. And this is both looking at physical, mental, and some creative outlets um, that you might utilize. Um, and one thing that I think is also important, thinking about um, different activities that both uh, utilize your um, physical, uh, obviously exercise, but also crossing the midline um, activities such as knitting, if you're able to knit, or if you're able to um, uh, use your hands for things like um, uh, drawing or crocheting or knitting, things like that, anything um, of that nature can be really calming. Um, so if you can get out your color, your, your markers and start coloring in your battery or your coffee cup, um, that would be something to consider. And this slide here, I want to talk a little bit about resilience. I know you guys have spoken about that in the past, but the good thing is resilience is on our side. We as humans are resilient by nature. And in this community, you are incredibly familiar and gold star athletes at accepting the unknown. Welcome to Parkinson's disease, right? Anyone who has lived with PD, cared for a partner, family member with PD has gone through all of this on some level. So you know the concept of tolerating uncertainty already. Um, and I think this could not be a better community to talk to you about this because every single day in Parkinson's is an uncertain day, right? So um, you are the kind of the, the, best, the best people to talk to and understand that. And um, I, I really thank you for for giving me that opportunity today. One of the important things that I, I also want to include is gratitude practice. Um, it's, sim it's a simple and personal thing that you guys can do uh, as individuals. Anyone can do this. Um, I did this this morning just before um, coming on here today. And it's something you just jot down little things that um, are important to you or that you're grateful for. So I wrote down the PD community, 
the sun. In Seattle, we're always grateful for the sun. Uh, uh, my tomato plant is doing well. I have not killed it yet. I'm really grateful for virtual communication and my friend is feeling better. So if you jot down five things every night, um, it's, really, it's actually really nice to look back to when you're having a not so good day or when you're feeling uncertain, uh, to look back at some of the things that you feel, feel grateful for, all right? This is a slide about compassion towards others. So recent studies, I don't really think we need to have studies on this necessarily to show this, but there are studies that show pain and stress can be improved by giving an altruism. And I, I, I'm sure more studies will be done in this unique area, but um, it's, it's not hard to, to see that when we see so many of our, um, you know, our, our friends and our community members coming out to help each other, um, it's, it's evidence that it's, uh, we are really uniting in this uncertain time. I really liked this quote, when this is over, may we remember how we reached out, not with our hands, but with our hearts. May we remember how we came together when the world was falling apart. And so I really think this, this giving of social support and in any kind of support that we can, um, that we can uh, offer to our communities and our neighbors uh, can actually really impact our own stress levels um, and something we should be, and I'm sure we already are doing on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, despite the unfortunate loss of life and the chaos that surround us, there is a silver lining. Families are spending more time together. We know that people have shifted focus from themselves to their communities, neighbors checking in on each other. Um, people actively supporting local businesses and staying connected from a distance uh, has become an essential aspect of our lives. We are now learning how to Zoom uh, and, and uh, finding new ways to communicate with friends and family. Um, so I wanted to add this quote from my friend and a colleague in New York who's working as a nurse practitioner out there. I called her and I said, what would you tell patients about uh, tolerating uncertainty since I sort of saw the first wave of COVID here in Seattle and she's really in it right now in New York. And so she sent me this, in the face of uncertainty, the only way to really get through the unknown is to trust that things are gonna work out for the better. Release the need to control the outcome for if you can get comfortable with not knowing, you'll be much more resilient to deal with any future obstacles life throws at you. And, um, you know, the last thing I would say is you have a community or you wouldn't be here. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that we just have to lean on each other and make sure that we stay healthy and help each other. And um, that will be the best thing we can do. Just lean on each other and trust that there, this too shall pass and, and we'll get through it. So, thank you. Oh, you're, you're muted. Amy. Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry. That was a beautiful summary of many things I think that we've hit on, uh, Tara. Um, and so maybe what I'll first have you do is teach us a little bit about nurse practitioners and what the, because I've never had a nurse practitioner on this um, show as yet. Um, and our, our virtual support group, COVID kind of uh, uh, social distancing group. Um, but uh, I think, you know, they're, they're an essential part of many teams um, across the country. And so maybe you can speak about uh, your training and kind of uh, what you do on your team. Yeah, sure. Um, so the role of a nurse practitioner is really vast. Um, so I'm a family nurse practitioner and um, there's nurse practitioners that are trained in adult and gerontology, um, pediatrics, uh, women's health, um, uh, um, there's midwife, uh, midwifery nurse practitioners, and I'm forgetting. Probably like mental health, right? Mental health. <laughs> sure, psych nurse yeah. practitioners, sure. Um, and acute care, and uh, and so as a and so we all work in different different areas. So um, you know, I was I there's some some nurse practitioners work inpatient and some work outpatient. Um, so I work at, right now, I work outpatient in a um, movement disorders clinic. 
Um, so I work as a uh, working with four. I work with four other physicians right now, um, and so nurse practitioners can see um, there. So statewide, there's different rules for um, the auton the autonomous role of a nurse practitioner, but in most states, including Washington and New York, and and I think the majority of states now. Um, the role is that uh, nurse practitioners can see, manage, and treat their own patients. And, um, and there's a lot of autonomous NP clinics out there. And we're really here to be a support because there's not enough of, there's not enough physicians out there. That's sort of why our role came to be. Um, and so as I'm in a specialty clinic, um, my role is, is sort of a little bit different than a lot of other NPs. Um, but I have a really great uh, opportunity because of my family practice background in that um, in my clinic when I see patients, I'm thinking about the patient as a whole. And so we're going through obviously all of the normal, um, the normal things that you would go through with a, with a physician, um, looking at their medications, thinking about their um, therapies that they're needing, but also I'm asking questions about their, you know, their whole health. There are, they, do they have diabetes? Do they have hypertension? Do they have um, cholesterol problems? Are we, you know, do we need to think about their home situation? Kind of looking at it as a bigger picture, um, thinking about their social situation a little bit more. It's kind of a bigger, um, just a bigger, wider net. Um, but it differs for every every role and every um, every clinic a little bit, and so we kind of have to make our niche wherever we are, and that's sort of what I found with every NP that I've seen. And why did you? It seems like you really gravitated toward, towards Parkinson's. I know you met um, Dr. Fleischer, and you enjoyed working with her. But what what drew you to being um, you know interested in this population and helping them? Yeah. I think it was the it was the patients, and I soon as I'm sure you would agree, like the more that I meet these patients, the more I learn from from them about how I mean how strong and and resilient. When we're speaking about resilience. I mean, um, yeah, I think that it's. I was in neurology before, but I, I just I sort of uh, the first Parkinson's patient I met, I just felt like. Uh, I, yeah, I, I felt like their journey was so unique and every Parkinson's patient is so unique. And so I think that is what makes working in Parkinson's so fascinating as a provider is that every individual requires a really unique um, uh, approach to their management and treatment. There is no one algorithm for how to treat a patient with Parkinson's because everybody's uh, progress is going to be different. Everybody's needs are going to be different. Everybody's uh, journey is going to be, is going to be different. So I think that is what makes it fascinating as a provider and what drew me to it in the first place. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I've also been drawn to the patients and I think when I was in uh, neurology residency, I'd always look, I'd look at the list of patients that were coming in and I was like, oh, yay, Parkinson's patients. And I would not have that reaction with other diagnoses that won't be mentioned at the moment. Um, yeah. So I, I agree. And I think it's a fascinating, it's it's sort of, you you don't just treat the person and that's this one symptom, it's this complexity and then the person in their world, right? It's like, you know, their, their, their family members, their, yes. where they live, you know, many, many aspects of what we're, um, you know, sort of, I think drawn to is, is probably just know, getting to know them over a period of time as well. Yeah. The one thing I should say also uh, relating back to my role that I think maybe if you haven't um, worked with an NP before or people who haven't seen an NP before, if um, the physicians are, their schedules are, are busy, I see patients for urgent visits or after they've been in the hospital and they need to get in quickly. That's where an NP comes in sort of the, um, the uh, person to, when you need to see a, uh, a provider really quickly, I'll, I'll be kind of the as needed provider on call for that situation, so. That's great. Um, so yeah, so you have a unique um, kind of uh, 
viewpoint because um, you were in Seattle, which was sort of where this first kind of started to happen in our in 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 our country, and I think it started to happen in nursing home in a nursing home specifically. Um, what was sort of your sense of what the patients were feeling at that time, and and um, how you were able to sort of um, help support them at that initial stage? Yeah, there was a lot of anxiety, and um, I think just a lot of uncertainty. And I think when I when we were in the hospital, still when we were still seeing patients, the uh, the unknown of how things were going to go in terms of their care. So I think that has changed a little bit now that we're starting to use Zoom and people are starting to learn that they're still able to get their care in different ways and they're getting to learn how virtual care is a, um, not, a, not necessarily a replacement, but a, uh, an alternative for care and that um, uh, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. You know, we are going to get through this and that we're here for them. So I think there's a little bit of ease that's, that's, um, that's set in here, uh, but it's certainly since since it started, yeah, there's a little bit of ease I've seen in, in Seattle, yeah. So Tim has written, my NP is wonderful. I love okay. the fact that I can communicate with them quickly. Yes. And but then um, there's also been a few other um, comments. Uh, somebody wrote, I know I should be exercising at home every day, but I haven't been. Should I push myself or forgive myself? What's your Ooh. <laughs> well, first you should forgive yourself. And then I think um, maybe try to do, set yourself a goal for, you know, five or 10 minutes every day um, for, you know, this week, even if it's for um, just doing one exercise that you really love or something that you can stay consistent with. That's really the key. Something that's fun for you and consistent. You can stay consistent with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I echo the um, sentiment. I think even as providers, and I'm an academics, and I sh I should be. I, I think you know many people are like, well, I've been really productive and knocked out a bunch of papers, or you know, done a ton of my you know pile of things to do. And I think it's it's sort of an interesting mix. I think for many of us, there's time in some ways, but then there's also this emotional kind of. Um, toll I think that it's taking on each and every one of us as healthcare providers, as a parent for me, as a person on this planet. And so all of these sorts of things end up making it hard sometimes to focus on getting certain things done. So I think mm -hmm. that sort of balance between kindness, uh, forgiveness, and, and also motivation is very important to kind of, um, you know, ride that balance. And I think it's ultimately important to, st to stay um, you know, with the schedule, if you can, and, and try to um, regularize your day, as we've heard from many of our speakers, as best we can, so that we're waking up and trying to do our hygiene stuff and getting ready as if we have a doctor's appointment or have an outing to go to, just to sort of set some um, parameters on the day. But then mm -hmm. I think if you find yourself not getting through all the things that you tried to do um, or, or lay, lay in front of you, I think it's important to set some goals, but, you know, don't be hard on yourself. I think each and every one of us is feeling um, kind of just tired and, and not sure why. And it's a lot of it has to do with, I think, the emotional mix and the uncertainty. And um, I think even, you know, the, the day is spent supporting not just ourselves, but pretty much everyone that we meet. So I think that, right. that um, you know, that's just quite, quite natural to feel inefficient and, and sort of, um, tired. So listen to your bodies as well. If you feel exhausted and you feel like maybe a restorative nap might be helpful, you know, go ahead and take a short nap and, and kind of regroup. I think, you know, this is um, meant to be uh, guidelines and, and not to be hard on yourself, but try to try to set goals and try to stick to them as best you can. Um, somebody else wrote, it's difficult to stay motivated. Absolutely. And then Merv wrote, Easter weekend was hard for me. It didn't feel like a holiday and really hit home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. It's the holidays that it can be really hard right now, I know, because we're trying to have these joyous times when we're still kind of in this uncertain and difficult and somewhat grieving uh, to some degree uh, for some people. And also we want to connect with our families. So, and if we are connecting with our families, sometimes we're doing it in this virtual way, which is totally new. So there's a lot of new and 
confusing feelings going around when really we just, you know, you wanted to probably be with your family around a table and that's understandable. I think we just have to normalize these feelings and, and know that it's okay to feel that way and you're not alone. Um, but this is not forever. It's important to know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Easter was an interesting weekend for sure. Um, I think that uh, we, um, I, I had been sending around to some people, uh, there was this concert, um, I don't know if people watched, um, this uh, Andrea Bocelli had sang from the Duomo in Milan and it was like a worldwide event. And so I had tried to send it around and I think I saw that many people were also watching. And so I think the sort of sense of a connection, um, even if it's virtual with an event kind of like this. So there's a connection where we're all kind of tuning in. And even if you knew that a video was available of this recording, you know, that you could watch next week or next year or next month, um, I think it's very different to kind of connect here and be motivated and know that it's a shared experience, which is kind of really beautiful. And I think even that concert, even though it wasn't at the best time necessarily for us on the West Coast um, to wake up and ha have this, um, you know, we knew that all around the world, I was watching it with some Italian friends even, and it was a really kind of a beautiful, um, you know, sort of experience to be able to do this. Um, and it was, it was a very beautifully done thing where they were highlighting, um, you know, the, the, the sort of seriousness um, and uh, in, in this church that was very austere and he was basically alone with the, the organist. But then there was a sort of beautiful um, views of the cities that had been affected around and then panned into uh, by the end of it um, some shots of Paris and Italy and and, and, oh. and England and and so I think again a really connecting kind of thread of all of us going through the same experience um, which I think is is really um, kind of remarkable and and unprecedented but but in some ways beautiful and some some sort of you know silver linings possibly to be felt um, hopefully at the end of all of this. Um, so Jean wrote, uh, besides the virus, my husband um, is in rehab having broken his femur on March 1st. I have not seen him since March 13th and the frustration is high, but now they want to discharge him on Thursday and he's not walking unaided. And so I'm looking at an appeal and wondering if it's safer in rehab or at home where there will be at least five people coming and going each day with the therapist and in home care. Um, yeah, that's very complex, um, Jean. Um, do you do you want to speak to that? I don't know if you can see that comment, um, Tara. It's just about um, Jean's husband um, is in the rehab and her mixed emotions of, um, I'll, maybe I'll say something and then you can say something as well, Tara. I mean, I think many of us, um, there's, and I have a number of, of friends and family that are in similar sort of situations. It's a bit of a catch-22 because if you do have somebody come back home, it's hard to get home physical therapy and home care and in the COVID setting. But then if somebody's at the hospital or in the rehab, then you can't actually see them. And mm -hmm. so it's this sort of, you know, balance between um, the emotional feeling of wanting to help and be there, but knowing that the safest thing is for possibly somebody to be separated from you as a, as a loved one. And it's, it's, there's no easy answers for this at all. It's very, very, sort of um, complex and, and complicated in each and every one of these cases. I've been working with some folks, um, some of my own patients and trying to figure out what the best answer is. And I think safety is really important. I think that, you know, if somebody's at a huge fall risk um, by bringing them home, I think that it's probably better to stay on the safe side and have them, you know, be in a place where they can have access to transfers and not end up back at the hospital, um, you know, that would be sort of my vote. But again, it's such a balance. And if you have a way, um, and sometimes the nurses can um, help with this or the aides um, to be able to maybe use an iPad to FaceTime or communicate, I think that it's not nearly as good as having a personal connection, certainly, but uh, physically being there, but at least will hopefully let you feel like you can see um, your husband, uh, Jean. Uh, I would just, yeah, I would agree with you uh, as much as this, it sounds so difficult for you and I feel for you right now, I would say the uh, probably safer um, wherever he's not going to have a risk for falls, which might be where he is. But Gina would call the, um, a social worker and she might be here. She might be able to give you a little more um, information about 
uh, sort of the logistics of, of how a uh, transfer um, would work if, if and when. Um, but uh, but we're, we're thinking of you, that's, a, that's not easy. And I, I know um, that for a lot of patients right now, that's, that's a really hard thing about how, how do we connect with our loved ones um, right now and keep them safe at the same time. Um, but uh, I agree, keeping them out of the hospital is, is number one. But yeah, call the social worker. They can often be really helpful for um, kind of uh, figuring out some of these situations where you, um, for some way for you to be able to, to see your husband. Okay. Um, and then, um, so I know that you also used to be in New York and you have these connections with these people there. Do you have any other thoughts about um, what's happening there and um, any advice from there to our folks across the country? You know, it's interesting. So when I was talking to um, my friend in New York, she's, she was saying that, uh, talking about some of our colleagues that are um, in the hospitals on the front lines right now, she was saying that people are just really coming together and having a... Uh, a really positive spirit and that that is what's getting them through. Um, that's what's getting patients through. And there's almost this, um, a myth, because it's so intense right now uh, and the, the situation in New York is so intense that that's what's, that's what's feeding them is this, um, this communal spirit that's coming from all, all parts of the, the, um, the country. And so I think if you, if you have friends and family in parts of the country that are affected, giving them a call or writing them a letter or an email, um, you know, like we were talking about how, how altruism both helps you and the other person. I think that's an excellent uh, example of how that can help in today's world of this pandemic. But um, there are so many parts uh, of the country that are affected and um, New York in particular. Yeah, I, I don't know that uh, New York is any different than New Jersey, but, uh, or any of these other particular hotspots, um, it, it just seems like the more we can support our, uh, our healthcare workers and our essential workers who are on the front lines with uh, compassion and with gratitude, they're hearing us, they're feeling it, and um, the more we can do that, the, the better it will be, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think you had said be kind to yourselves and also be kind to one another. I think even in any interaction, I think you, we have to remember that everyone's very stressed. And I know that people are feeling frustrated and, you know, going to the store or so-and-so did this on the street or, you know, but I think, again, we're living in very, um, you know, sort of difficult times and anything we can do to just add that extra bit of sweetness or kindness or you know um, before reacting like you said you were sort of like we have a space between when something happens when we can when we sort of feel something emotionally and then how we can react to it and so anything we can do even if it's if you're a caregiver and your loved one is stressing you out or if it's somebody else in your neighborhood or somebody, and you know, we're all in, in very tight spaces in some of these situations with neighbors that might be making too much noise or I don't know, whatever. But you know, just anytime you have the ability to give some kindness, I think it, and paying it forward, it will hopefully just, you know, reverberate um, around. And I think uh, some of that um, can hopefully come back and, and help the whole sort of spirit of it. So, um, so I think, um, Maureen wrote, I'm used to exercising three times a week and seeing my friends. I keep connected with my friends by phone, but I'm really missing seeing my friends' faces. I'd like to join an online PMD Alliance support group. I'm unsure of how it will work by phone, but I would like to try it. Do you have any experience with people joining support groups by phone? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, maybe, uh, Andrea, you can perhaps reach out a little bit more. Um, I spoke to a colleague who's um, yesterday about trying to connect more. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, um, Tara. One of the concerns that we've had doing this online support group with the technology and the need to be able to connect, and these guys at the PMP Alliance have been very kind to trying to help people who, who can't connect on Zoom to give them a little crash course or whatever and support. Um, 
I'm sure in Seattle you have patients, because uh, I know my sister used to work up there, um, that come from a distance, sometimes are living on the islands or over bridges or over by ferry sometimes and things like that. Um, how are you keeping people who may not have technology connected? Do you have any thoughts about that or any tips? Um, have you guys thought that a little bit? Well, now that I've met the tech crew on the PMD Alliance, now I'm going to have to have them join join me for everything so that they can help all of our patients. Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, in Seattle, it's kind of it's kind of neat because now we see people from I actually see people from Alaska, Montana, because there's no Parkinson specialists uh, in Montana at all, um, as far as I know. And um, so, but in terms of keeping them connected, right now we're doing sort of what you're doing, and uh, we definitely have you're using virtual uh virtual technology for uh telehealth for support groups and as far as i know uh we have support groups that are open for for anyone and i'm happy to provide that information um to you guys yeah but even if it wasn't technology, have you guys been using any, um, have you been mailing things to people or like, we are just worried about the sort of po populations of folks that may not even have a computer or have yeah. um, internet access, um, you know, that might be quite isolated. So I don't know if um, one idea that had been circulated here was um, a phone tree um, and people kind of maybe checking in with each other by phone um, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, these sorts of things I think are, are possible helps, but there's certainly, you know, and I think I, when I was speaking to a colleague yesterday, I think what she had mentioned is that I think it really, one of the things that's highlighted here is that, you know, we're so um, dependent now and in a good and bad way on our environment, right? Like our local street that we live in or the people in our building um, even more than we ever have. And these people might not have been anyone you'd ever even have taken the time to wave at or, you know, um, mm -hmm. knock on their door and maybe leave like a, a little letter saying, you know, I'm happy to try to help you with this or that, you know, if there's somewhat older or more frail than you. Um, but I think now people are sort of just looking at their own backyards and their own, you know, direct physical community in some ways as, as sort of a, a way to sort of um, gather some social connection. And even if it's maybe checking in by phone or something like that. I, I think these are some ideas. Um, it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, so people have written here, a group of us are texting each morning, which is cute. That's great. Um, our church started a phone tree for members who do not have technology or just want to talk to somebody. So that's- That lovely. makes so much cute. sense. Yeah. 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 And then Andrea said, we have, we had some corporate volunteers reach out offering to their tech expertise, looking at setting up one-on-one -on -one help calls for everything from how to Instacart, wow. to set up emails, stay tuned, uh, and read your PMD Alliance emails. That is amazing. I mean, I think, wow. you know, talk about, um, you know, we have, we have a number of folks that are out of jobs possibly and wanting to help. Um, I mean, I think we have some abilities to connect people, um, you know, through, through this beautiful idea. I love that corporate. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to bring that back to my hospital. Actually. I think that's a, a really great idea because and you have a lot of super, super techies in, in Seattle area. Right. Sure. Right. That's yeah. I, I definitely <laughs> think there's plenty of people <laughs> with the tech experience to help out there. I think that's a great thing that any, I mean, any hospital group could, could start for, for their patients, um, especially the ones that have, um, that maybe don't have internet or access or, um, uh, it's certainly setting up, uh, food delivery is, is, is really helpful. So place my first grocery order with Walmart. Great. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. That's cute. So, um, so maybe, um, Tara, we can talk a little bit about your education interest. So what kind of things have you found to be helpful um, in, in using education? And what are the, the unmet needs have you noticed um, that people might be able to think about and how to fill them in, in this population, in Parkinson's? Yeah, so I would say the biggest thing is uh, medication management would probably be the biggest thing that I talk about um, or that I will bring patients and caregivers in for separate visits just because it is so 
hard to manage with multiple medications. And it's obviously so important to take your Parkinson's medications at the right times. Um, but it's also important to know what medications you take. And I think sometimes health literacy is not, uh, is undervalued. And, and so when I bring in, um, they can bring in a patient and a caregiver and really go over what their meds are, why they're taking them. That can really help with um, when we set up a medication management plan. So then we'll set up not only how they take their meds, but why they're taking it. And then, um, and then a system, you know, if you're taking your medication seven times a day and you have a pill box that's only six, has six uh, compartments in it, how are we going to get that seventh dose in? Are we going to put it by your bedside? Or So we always come up with, like we said, every patient's individual, every patient has their own daily life. So we come up with an individual system for every patient um, and also uh, educate on why it's important to, to have a management system for your meds and know what your meds are. Because as we know, pharmacies can get can get a little uh, messed up with your medication orders. And so the more you know, the better. And I really encourage patients to carry their own little card of meds on them at all times. Don't know your meds by their colors. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> so well, um, you should so ask your, um, and you can, go ahead. On that note, um, so what, what kind of, um, where do you, what pillbox? Do you have any tips on pillboxes and things like that? I have so many tips on pillboxes, but um, the, so it will depend on what, I think it depends on what kind of, uh, how many pills you need and, and what kind of, um, how, like how you're taking them. So I love um, the easy pill, which is like an interval timer uh, that also has pills also has pill slots in it and it has an interval timer. So you don't have to say, I'm taking my pills at seven, 11, three and seven. I'm taking my pills four hour, every four hours. Um, and you just wake up and, and you press a button and every four hours it will alert you. So you can wake up at a different time every day. Um, so there's a couple of interval timers out there that have uh, med boxes in them and that, so some of those are good. And, um, but I'll, I think it's, it's, it's hard to find a good interval timer. I think medication timers in general are really helpful for patients. It's hard to start using them, but they're really helpful when you use them. Uh, and you'll find that if you're somebody who fluctuates and has a lot of off time, try it for one week. And if you feel, if you don't feel better, you can stop. But if you, I bet you'll probably feel better. I'm sure you've had that experience too. So, so, so you teach around pills, pill times and what the pills yeah, are for. What yeah. other things are you educating around? What are the other, yeah. we have about four minutes. Maybe we can talk about one other thing that you love to teach around or that you feel people are really helped by your teaching. Yeah. So I think this also goes to what an NP is and um, learning more about um, your, uh, you know, the pros and cons of um electing to for a surgical procedure. I think that's something that I, um, I do for patients. So sometimes there's not enough time when you're in a, a visit with your physician to really go over all of your, um, all of your choices. So we'll have a separate visit just to, just to kind of go over some of your options or, um, or, uh, educate about, you know, uh, some of the, uh, you know, what is Duopa? What is some of these alternate, um, uh, carbidopa, levodopa modalities that you might be interested in. So um, having that extra, and we see patients for, for I mean, I see patients for an hour, um, just like the physicians. And uh, for me, that's a, that's a necessary amount of time I won't see for any, for any amount less because it, I have to, I have to be able to, to, spend the time both doing the assessment uh, and treatment and also building in this education. So for, for Duopa, for DBS education, for med education, um, for, and for really any questions about um, new meds, um, new psych meds, new urologic meds, you, uh, new blood pressure meds, anything like that. Yes, every appointment is an hour. I did not move to Seattle. I said, if I'm going to move to Seattle, I'm seeing every patient for a full hour because you all deserve it. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that sounds like an amazing practice environment and your patients sound very fortunate to, to get you for an hour. And that's not, unfortunately, necessarily the model that all of us have in the country. Um, 
But it, you know, I think that what we're trying to highlight on this um, uh, Zoom, you know, virtual conference is also the richness of the multi-dimensional providers that one can access in some situations. You may not have. I mean, like you said, some places in Montana, you don't even have one person who knows anything about. Right you know, is really specialized in Parkinson's. Uh, but hopefully we could get this virtual support group to all those patients over there. Um, but I think, you know, then we have places that have the richness of having doctors and nurse practitioners, and we've had occupational therapists, physical therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, you know, at our VA, we have the luxury of having even a psychiatrist who works with us. And we have an amazing okay. nurse coordinator that, um, that works with us as well. What is the difference, just for those of us, um, the uh, you know here? What is so when you go to become a nurse practitioner? Can you teach about the what is the actual schooling that that is? So there's you go to nursing school and then and then and there's a separate training, right? Yeah. Right. So it's like and some people go right from nursing school to the NP. Some people do nursing and then work as a nurse for a while and then do the NP later, right? The additional training. Right. And how many years is the, the additional training to get your NP? It varies depending on which um, program. Every program is a little bit different. I think they're normally about uh, a year and a half to two years. Okay. And then you said you can subspecialize within that. So then some people have the family thing versus the mental health or the, the obstetric. So, no, that is the, so some will be, that that year and a half, two years is either family or okay. So adult you, you or, do that yeah. entire time in a subspecialty. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, I'm going to give you the last minute to say sort of a wrap up um, and wish everyone. Um, and then somebody just wrote, "Is there a movement disorder specialty available to NPs?" There is not. I made all of my clinicals kind of veer towards neurology because I was a neuro nerd. And then I kind of tr went into, when I went to NYU, I trained with the movement disorders uh, neurologist there. But there is currently, there's some neurology fellowships now for new NPs. Um, and I may want to correct myself because I'm not sure if some NP programs might be longer than two years. I'm not positive about that. Um, but I, as far as I know, they're not. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, to wrap up, um, Thank you. It was great to talk to all of you. And if you have any other questions for me, um, feel free to email me. And um, it was really great to, to speak with you. And thank you for, for having me. I wish you guys all um, a very safe and healthy um, year. Please make sure to take care of yourselves and practice uh, self-care. And remember that we're in this together, OK? And we'll put up, we'll put up um, Tara's uh, um, the, the slides. And also if you have any resources around the pills and pill boxes yeah. and things like that, um, and any other resources that you might have, we'll, we'll add them at the end. Um, all right, back to you guys, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. That was a great session. Um, I'll leave you with a, a teaser for the next time the gang's getting together. It's going to be this Friday, the 17th at noon Pacific. We're talking with um, Michael Oaken. Um, he's the National Medical Director at Parkinson Foundation, one of the co-authors of the Ending Parkinson's Disease book, and has been at the forefront of a lot of things in the Parkinson's world. So um, he's going to be on, and Indu's going to put him through the ringer, interview him. Um, and uh, so we hope to see you all back um, Friday the 17th um, at noon. So thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye now.